clap one on three. One, two, three. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're so glad that you're here. As always, I am your host, Lauren Ash. And as always, I am joined by my co host, S with the most S, Christy Oxborough. How are you feeling? <laughs> I'm doing great. Sharky Not as just, great as you. <laughs> yeah, Sharky just got up here and gave me a full kiss on the cheek. So if you're listening and not watching, just know if you hear purring or a light rumble in the background, that's what it is. He does like to to make an appearance. Not he as is... much lately, but... Yeah, you know, it's it's usually towards the end now mm. that he'll sometimes come up. This is It's rare for him to be here from the beginning. Um, but, but damn, if he doesn't love those Velcro tongue kisses, you know what I mean? Of course. I just take this to mean uh, he's finally coming around on the banter. He's like yeah. before before he was like, I'll circle back when they get to the true crime. But now he's like, no, 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 I uh, I like Chucklehead. Yeah. yeah. Well, and listen, it makes sense because I, I am wearing my true crime and catnip shirt, which I saw oh, this today gosh. as I was choosing what to wear for this record. And I, I laughed out loud at my own bit, like my own bit of putting these fedoras on our cats, which yep. is so stupid. Um, anyway, uh. These are available at truecrewmerch.com. Speaking of <laughs> speaking of truecrewmerch.com, yeah, I have to very quickly tell this story. Mm -hmm. So I told this to Christy earlier today, <laughs> and we just were dying laughing over voice notes. So, spoiler alert: the holidays are coming, oh. and I have been known on truecrewmerch.com to put out a yearly Christmas ornament, so that I think. I think I have done like two per year sometimes. This year it's only going to be one. Um, but that's also because I've got a design that I'm really happy with. <laughs> uh, so I sent it to Christy the, the other day. I was like, I just made this. I'm trying to see if I can quickly pull up a photo so I can at least show for, for the people watching on YouTube. Um, so, <laughs> so I decided for this year's ornament that mm -hmm. I would put on pictures of when Christy and I uh, did our first Love Actually cosplay. Yeah. And we inadvertently chose the same character. So when the Zoom opened, we were both dressed as the same character, which of course is the little boy from the Nativity play mm -hmm. who inexplicably has Spider-Man face makeup on. Yes. Um, so basically I put the both pictures of both of us in those <laughs> outfits. I put some Christmas lights on it and then it just yeah. says, never forget. On the back... It simply says, Merry Christmas from these little Spider-Men 2024. So I, I submit the uh, design. I save the design. And then as I always do, I immediately was ordering <laughs> one so that I can, you know. Product my, testing. My, always. my quality control, as I always do. Great. No harm, no foul. Wonderful. <laughs> I get an email that's like, Dear Lauren Ash. We cannot print your latest design. We, it has been flagged for copyright infringement. If you feel that this is not just, message us and let us know. Now, yeah. this, this happened once before when I was trying to make shirts that said, Good night, Dave Grohl. Right. And because Dave Grohl is a real name, it flags it. And it's like, you can't do that. You can't put someone's name on here. Um, now, I'm sure that there's other probably printing places where you could but that these are the these are the rules that we're playing within yes so i get this message and i'm like oh shoot i guess i'll have to send a message about this and then i find myself composing the following message and i want to remind you like this will go to a human because when i've had to deal with this before with the dave Grohl issue for example i i'm sure it's a computer program that flags it but when you then respond sure. it goes to a human so my my message was something as follows to whom it may concern. I know that this design has been flagged for copyright infringement. But this is photographs of myself and my podcast co-host dressed as young boys who are wearing Spider-Man face makeup. I don't believe it actually infringes on any copyright. I own the rights to the photographs. <laughs> if you would, I would appreciate releasing the hold. <laughs> Best, Lauren. And it's just the idea that I had to earnestly write a letter that said, 
This is myself and my podcast co-host, dressed as boys, dressed as Spider-Man. Surely this doesn't violate any rules. <laughs> Here's mm -hmm. the thing that's even better. Typically when this happens, they respond to you. The person responds to you. This yeah. time, they just released the hold. I think the person was like, what are these two yahoos doing? <laughs> yeah, I guess it's fine. Yeah. And then I realized that the other thing is, is that I'm sure these people are like, yeah, good luck with whatever this item is if you think people will buy it. <laughs> and I was what I wanted to write back is be like, just so you know, we have a very devoted audience that would <laughs> love to feature this on their family Christmas tree for years to come. Oh, think Best. of the children will frighten. Yeah. Oh, God. It just was like, it just slayed me. Like, again, having to have an earnest business email describing these are photographs of myself and my podcast co-host dressed as young boys dressed as spider-man like <laughs> it was just the specificity mm -hmm. the earnestness and then the also the like the the business tone yes it just killed me it just killed me nothing makes me laugh harder than the fact that you it's not that you said like we're we're being characters from a movie no you specifically said that we are dressed as little boys dressed as Spider-Man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I thought if I got into like we're playing, we're 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 dressed up as characters from Love Actually, then they may still keep the hold on. Like it's like you can't oh, do that. So I was trying yeah. to be like, this is this is random. Yeah. Because by the way, again, like I think if you polled a thousand people on the street, family feud style, um, I yeah. guess it's technically 100 when they do it. Do they really do it? I don't think so. Oh, anyway, well. um, if you poll 100 people on the street and said, do you know this boy? I think most of them would say, no, what the hell is that? <laughs> would you be surprised to know that's two middle-aged women? <laughs> <laughs> it's... Who have a podcast. Like, this is the other <laughs> thing. This is the Audio other thing to remember. Mean. This person's going to be like, so these two dressed up this way to record an audio recording? I mean, I just feel yeah. like this person must have gone through such a range of thoughts and emotions in such a short period of time. And again, then was like, I don't want to engage. Oh, we're going to be workplace talk. We're, we're going to be water cooler banter for sure. Yeah. 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 My, again, what I said to you in that moment was I really hope that person just gives us a listen to see. <laughs> and then... Like listens just for like twenty minutes and goes, I get it. Yeah, I then get. They're like, she, I get why she's a kook. I was, I was skeptical, <laughs> yeah. but now I'm realizing she's my kook. That's the hope. There it is. That'd be yeah. great. I would love to someday uh, have somebody who's like, that was me. I got your email. <laughs> like, I would love that, and I'd because oh. I want to hear what were the first thoughts. Yeah, like were you initially like <laughs> worried about our mental health <laughs> were you like oh oh boy let's give him a win you know i mean my hope is that oh my yeah. hope is that but anyway go to truecrewmerch.com they should be up and available at this point of this uh airing um I think it's a hilarious item, and I think the story makes it even better. Again, my kingdom to continue to do a job in which I have to send earnest emails uh, about the shit, the, the, the nonsense that we get up to. I shouldn't say this in the record, but I'm going to. Okay. It just hit me. I mean, never forget makes me laugh so hard. And I know you've said you're only doing this one. Mm-hmm. But if you ever consider doing any of the other ones we've ever done. Yeah. Joy to the world where you're dressed as joy. Oh, wow. Yeah. Let's get buzzed. And there you are as Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> I mean, joy to the world and beyond. Oh. And then there there's the two of us in, in, in the non-Pixar outfits. <laughs> well, that's the other thing. We I, Here's yeah. the thing. That's a great idea. I would pitch it for 2025. I might not be able to to charm my way out, out of that one. <laughs> Did Little I mention trouble, it, was an, baby. it was an audio medium? An audio medium. Again, like, 
I think it's also because we always joke about the fact that we do cosplays for something that very few people yeah. view. Yeah. Yeah. But we're seeing it the whole time. And really, what are we doing if not just trying to entertain each other? Yeah. I also want you to know, in the in the realm of exactly that, of entertaining each other, uh, after our last record, <laughs> I... Uh, I was like, oh, shit, I really need to, like, do a quick buzz through Love Actually, mm -hmm. take screenshots of as many characters as I can, and then just really look through them and decide. And I I was like, because I just need to get this. I need to decide so I can start ordering pieces and at least have them. Because we never know when we're going to. We might record it a little earlier or whatever. Right. So I was going through and I got one that I was like, oh. Oh, I think that's the winner. I think that's the winner. And then a scene came up and I did a screenshot and I looked at it and I burst out laughing at the thought of me dressed as that immediate winner. I went through the rest and I took them so I could have it for next year. Of course. But I've got mine and I laughed out loud to myself for like 20 minutes straight. And I tried to explain like to my husband, like what my plan was. And mm -hmm. he was like, oh yeah. And I'm like in tears. I'm laughing so hard. And I'm like, but it's like so funny. And he was like, oh yeah. Like, he, it, so I don't, I'm not sure anybody else will find it funny, but I feel like you will. I feel I like you'll wait. be like, that's was, that was the choice. Yeah. And I, it's just, it's not something I would, would have done, but, um, it's not something I would have thought of, I but I'm wait. I'm pretty jazzed about it. Fantastic. Well, now I'm racking my brain for guesses, but I'm not going to guess. Oh, I don't know if you ever could, but there yeah. are so many that so many characters that you see for less than a minute. Yeah. That I'm like, they would be so good. And listen, if we discovered anything when we talked about this last, it's that a lot of your focus is how obscure of a character moment can I choose? Yeah. Which I love. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I I don't even know what it is. Um, but, I mean, the first time, I just went with Iconic, obviously, with the Spider-Man boy. Ditto. Because obviously so did you. So Iconic, we both chose of a plethora yeah. of choices. Thousands of characters. Um, So many. And then the next time, I was like, well... I've got to, I'm just get. I wanted to make my way through being each of the kids on that stage. And then last time I was like, I, no, I have to be comfortable. And this time it's like, I think I'll be comfortable and I don't have to make anything. Mm -hmm. So it's just going to be a, like buying things. I'm not going to like, I'm very excited about not having to fully, fully like, there's not going to be painting. I'm not paper mache I'm not whatever. But I I just feel like if I can get these things and do it a certain way, I think it's going to turn out. But I had very specific plans, like thoughts in my mind of where I was going to go. And then going through it, I was like, no, that's the only option. I love this for us. Again, I think you're going to laugh. And that's mainly my reason for doing it. I, all I want is a laugh out of you. And then I'm like, well, there we go. That was a, that was worth it. Oh, I'm I'm sure. I'm sure you'll get it. Yeah. Yeah. How beautiful. And look, if you if you ever need, I I have a large list. Oh, thank you. But I'm gonna tell you, most of them are obscure. <laughs> I can't do that. Cause then it's like I'm hacking your bit. You know what I mean? It's just it I don't mean for it to be the bit. It's just I mean, I, my, I think I, I think I said to this to you after the record last time when we were talking about like, oh God, we really got to look into that because it's coming up. Um, and then I was like, I could just be the poster for blue that Billy Mac writes on with the marker. And it's like, who would choose to just be a big poster with your little face in there? I don't know. I don't know how you'd pull it off. Like, would you? Would I don't you know either. A, would you make a giant frame and then have like two like masks on either side of you? Well, that's the thing. It's like, would my face be one of their faces or would my face be the color of the background? And I would just be. 
Or would it's... I go so far as to thinking I have the skill with face paint that I close my eyes and you can see the guys like on my face. <laughs> so when I close my eyes, I'm just like completely camouflaged into that poster. <laughs> What I like is the idea that you have been making your way as an unboxer and maybe it's going to turn into a very <laughs> intricate makeup artist. A level of detail. How would it ever? It how would would ever. I say it with love, but how? <laughs> but you're is... very talented, but I I to be honest, I just worry about the strain on your mental health. Like <laughs> I, I there's not a chance it would work, but this is how it always starts with me. It's got to start with a plan. That's insane, and mm -hmm. nobody would attempt it. Of course. And then I eventually whittle my way down to something that maybe can work. I don't know. Um, but yeah, that that poster, the idea of that makes me laugh. Um, and I, I, it was still a front runner when I was going through the movie. But then I was also like, I don't want, like, for the entire time to have this large frame on my face. But I also don't want my face to say like pricks because he writes something on the top that's like, we have little pricks or something. And I, I'm like, I can't have that on like on my face for the whole time. I like that. That's the line for you. <laughs> I mean, it was also uh, I'd have to look at it again to decide, um, but. Yeah, again, once I found the one, I was like, well, there it is. There were two other spots, two other scenes that I found characters that I was like, perfect. Perfect. Well, with your criteria, yeah. <laughs> now, I feel like the pressure's on for me no. because I'm like, am I doing a main character? Am I doing something obscure like she is? You know? Um. Oh, I don't know how much I should say. I feel like I shouldn't say anything just in case. Don't say anything. Um, but uh, yeah, look again. I, like, am I this... going to be the sprig of holly that Mister Bean puts <laughs> puts in the gift wrap? I hope so. I hope so. That isn't what you were going to be, was it? No, I am okay. going to be a human. Okay, fantastic. So that is something. Um, but I mean. Oh, there are so many, and part of me wants to say some of them, but I'm also like, oh, those will... But this is, like, years. This is at least a year from now, so no one's going to be like, you just told us. You've ruined it. Um, my heart also really sang at the at the three little girls when Hugh Grant is... Well, that's what I was going to be. <laughs> well, I was... My original thought, I was like, ooh, I'll be one of those girls because I'm obsessed with them. Um, or then I was like, I'll be his copper mm. with the, with the deep voice. I loved him. Um, and then during the pageant at the, for the big finale song, while the girl is singing, these four like B boys come out two on either side and their outfits are so specific that I was like, yeah. So I thought about being one of them. Cause I was like, those are. That's good. We have so much to unpack <laughs> from the last 30 seconds. Yeah. One, you saying B-boys in earnest. I don't know if we use that term anymore. I don't, I don't think it's think... offensive. I don't think it's offensive, but like, I don't think, do we? I don't know. As long as Ray Gun doesn't use it, then well, I feel Well, okay great point. It. And then what I love is, is that, yeah, the one that I had been toying with was, I hate Uncle Jamie. That's what I was thinking of doing. Oh, I'm not even, no, those aren't the kids I'm talking about. What are the kids you're talking about? When uh, Hugh Grant's going house to house and he's doing, mm -hmm. he's looking for her, he opens one door and there's three little girls. One, I think, has like fairy wings or something. And they're like, are you doing carols? I thought it was the same kids. No, because I hate Uncle Jamie is when Colin Firth goes home. Oh, yes. Goes to go to the Christmas, opens it, and there's all of his family. Oh, no, I know. And then he leaves. But, I but the girls the are just kids. by themselves. No. Really? As far as I know. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, I could, I, I could be wrong. No, but... I'm trying. You've just watched it. Why would I question her? She just saw it. 
Well, I'll tell you, <laughs> if you're looking for more things to unpack <laughs> about me, one of the other ones that I genuinely considered was Aurelia, but specifically the moment where <laughs> she's nude <laughs> with a blanket. And the two of them are talking after having gone in the water. And I was like, oh, I wouldn't have to wear a bra. And I could just... <laughs> okay. Hold on. I have a lot. There's, again, you're just, you can't be dropping these things on me. Okay. Okay, so first of all, you were like, this is a costume that would allow me to go brawless. I love this cri this criteria. Yeah. Well, Two, so would a b-boy. <laughs> Two, what I love is... <laughs> Aurelia, but specifically the moment where she's in a blanket. Oh my God, it's so funny. It's so yeah. funny. Um, you could also have a prop eel. If that was the case. Oh, yeah. That's one of my favorite scenes. The whole like, well, I hope there's not eels. Be careful not to disturb the eels. Like, I just, yeah. that whole scene. But there's something, she just, I mean, I wouldn't have been nude. I would have had like something on underneath. But just sitting there, just the, because this is my, this is my criteria. You might think it's specifically obscure. My criteria is this Zoom opens. And the, you see me and you immediately are like, what a fucking idiot. <laughs> and the idea of just you open the Zoom and there's me clutching a blanket going crim, crim. Uh, like you would have been like, oh my God, why are you naked Aurelia? <laughs> it's like, I don't know. Here's the thing I want to feedback though. You wouldn't but have known I that's think... who that was. What's that? You might not have known who I was supposed to be. No, I would have known it. Um, <laughs> don't know about those young girls, but know about that one. Um, no, what I was going to say is I think it's growth that you're even entertaining playing female characters. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, I'll it's, say it. it's very rare for you. So, well, I know you don't want any spoilers, but I'll say it. I didn't end up choosing a woman. <laughs> I would never even, I would never yeah. think you would. I would yeah. never think you would. Listen, and again, you've blessed us and all the dear listeners with things like you as Riker, which again is burned into all of our brains. It makes me feel very uncomfortable <laughs> when I think about it. Ah, sure. Sure. Um, Look, do so... I, would, I, would I ever entertain? I No, I would never do it because I, I don't want to make people feel that. But I just want to know, like, how would he do on Tinder? <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not going to make oh. a fake profile. I don't want anyone to make a fake profile. But I'm just too saying. late. It's already happened. Somebody's doing it as we speak. <laughs> I just I don't want to I don't want to know. But I'm also like he'd do OK. Right. We here's what it, here's the thing. Yeah. And I'm only half kidding. I think what we need to do is get you back in the beard and the hair. Yeah. We need it. We need a couple of different outfits. Oh, sure. We need holding to have probably fish? one with you holding a fish. I can yeah. Photoshop it. You don't actually have to touch the fish. Thank you very much. Um, and then I would really love to try this experiment because I'm going to be honest with you. I think you'd do very well. Excuse me. I think Riker would do very well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing. I'd have to come up with another name. William. Oh, I suppose. It only shows first names on there. I'd have to be Will. Will. Because I can't be Bill or Billy. No. Or Mac or Buddy. Sorry, that's <laughs> Cheryl Crow. <laughs> oh, right. Wow. Yeah. We, last time we spoke about this, <laughs> about how going, you hear something and your brain just goes to a song. Oh, yeah, no. I think it was I just, the one before that. They all run together. I just forgot that Cheryl Crow song. Yeah. Yeah. Did I ever tell you I saw her live once at an event? She played like two songs. She was fantastic. I bet she was. She was. And I want to say, I owe her an apology because in 1994, <laughs> it was the same year as Green Day's Dookie and I was very passionate, but she was getting a lot of love because all I want to do of course. came out at the, around the same time. 
And I wasn't kind. I wasn't kind. I was, I was, I was defensive of my boys. And if I've learned anything, 30 years later, 30 years, Lauren, like I love that I'm apologizing for something I did as a child. 30 years later, if I've learned anything, it's, it's that we got to support the women. We've got to support the other women. Yeah. She didn't need my support. She was fine. I was she a child. Yeah. But um, I guess I've always felt guilty about it. Now, when you say you were mean. Yeah. Like just talking to other people or did you do anything like? Mostly conversationally. Publicly. Oh, okay. Mostly conversationally. Um, I do believe okay. we had put together a, uh, like a class yearbook that year. <laughs> and I did put pet peeve, under pet peeve, I put Cheryl Crow. And I don't, I, I regret that. Oh, oh, it's in writing now. That's why we're circling back 30 years later. <laughs> I like that it's the 30th anniversary though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, next, yeah, it is. Oh my God. I was gonna say next year. I thought it was still 2023 unwell in the head um well i recently wrote the year as 2025 i'm living in the future i think that's better than living in the past i don't know if that's true well, i just full <laughs> cried at the thought of myself cosplaying as a woman in a blanket <laughs> like that's I'm, am i gonna literally hold the blanket closed the well, whole I time you, i assumed you'd get velcro I wouldn't have, but I. <laughs> now there's these after shower towels you can get, uh -huh. and it's like, and it's it's got a little elastic in the back, yeah. and then you do this, and you do this, Velcro, so then Ooh. then you can wear it like a dress. I have two of them. Well, I like that. They're game changers, and I'll tell you something. As someone who's been known to, I like to sit in a towel. I don't like to. Sure. Here's the here's what it is. I hate the feeling of drying myself. Oh, like sure. I'd like to sit for 10 minutes and let the towel self dry. self dry. The feeling of taking a towel to try and like, cause you're never fully dry. You're no, never your fully skin dry. gets clammy and it's yeah. not, it, I hate the feeling of it. Um, so as someone who likes to sit in a towel, yeah, this has been a game changer. Of course. Because typically if you're sitting in a towel, it's falling open, it's falling off, you know. Sure. I, I don't even know. I'm just an innocent little towel gal. <laughs> I've had two glasses of wine and I'm very, <laughs> very sorry. <laughs> Never be sorry for introducing us to towel gal. <laughs> I'm a little <laughs> towel gal. Um, I mean, I don't know if I feel one way or the other about okay. drying myself off. Um. But, but you know it's about the nude. I want to just get stuff back on. Mm. I just, and that, the only thing I need, as long as I'm, as long as I have a shirt and an underpant. Okay. That's all I need. That would be, that would be ideal. Um, Of course, uh, walking around my home uh, with children, there are always like a pants or a shorts or a, of course yeah. something. But um, yeah, I mean, what world to live in to have like just a a loosey goosey but cozy sweatshirt and then an underpant, <laughs> and then you get cold, go put on pants. Fuck no, get a blanket. I'm basically mentally making movie <laughs> night in my head. What I'm hearing is that you're you're like talking about a like a slanket or a, a snuggie oh. just without the slit in the back of the top. You're okay with there being a slit in the bottoms. <laughs> she can go bottom forward, folks, but she does sure. not want a slit in the back of that shirt. Oh yeah. Yeah. Let that be covered. I mean, I should all be covered, but it's just I'll tell you what it is, and I shouldn't. But I will, because it's too late. Uh, the temperature's getting a little further down. Oh. And I'm not happy about it. it. It is what it is. I live where I live. I have grown to accept it. But we like to sleep with the window open. Mm -hmm. Little cool breeze, little air. It's nice. But it's been getting so cold that we've had to change our sheets from the beautiful sheets that like are so nice and cool to something a little bit warmer and I find that most of my like 
pajama pants and pajama shorts. When I go to roll, they like stick on the, so I have to like really work to move. And if I have to really work to roll over, I'm waking up way more than I want to. Just let me be comfortable. But just the underpants, I'm golden. Full top. I have to do a full top because I, I don't need nudity. Listen, it's your prerogative. Yeah. But like, I've been embracing nudity underpant? more over the last few years, as you know. I've been oh, embracing sure. being nude. But, you know. Oh, me embracing and openly telling people that I'm like, just the underpants? I'm okay with that. Stop saying underpants. You've said it many times. Uh, but it, So many times. I also am very appreciative because the P A N. T-I-E-S is no, a word I can't handle. We don't say that word. We don't word. say that in these houses. Gross. barf arama. Yeah, um, don't like it. But this is this it. is big for me to be able to I, be like, I could comfortably sit like that. Not with children in the home. If they were like asleep, I could maybe be sitting on a couch with a blanket. But if they're not, now I'm like, well, if they're not home, is this just going to be who I am? I they go to so. school and I'm just like, there go the pants. And I'm just wandering around. And it's, I just am going to have to remember I'm not wearing any when my doorbell goes. Yeah. Because nobody needs that. Well, listen, it would be a gift to whoever's there. Thank you very much. Look, we're not going to, we're not going to put up one for me and one for Riker and see who does better. We're not. <laughs> That's not a part of this. It's not a competition. We're not. But if we did, <laughs> it just felt like that's where you were going with it. Yeah. Um, I've got two quick pieces of feedback and then we'll move on. Of course. One, if you're worried about the this, the getting stuck as you're turning, yeah. may I suggest a satin pajama? Interesting. You're slip sliding around. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Uh, I don't need to thing. be stationary. No, no, no. And it's, it's slidey. Um, nice. And then the other thing I just wanted to feedback about one of my own experiences is that if anyone knows me, and you all do by now, uh, I prefer a very oversized Moomoo-like nightshirt if I'm going to wear one. Oh, sure. Uh, so I have like three X's that I've bought. They're very large. Sure. Right? Uh, in the of the – God, we're talking so much about the merch in the, this opening bit. Anyway, um, from our merch store. <laughs> Here's what I'll say. I – Bought these when I was in a larger body, and my body is smaller now, and that's neither here nor there, uh, neither better nor worse. <laughs> but the feedback I have is that what started happening to me is because they're oversized, hmm. and then I'm I am smaller, I get stuck in them in the night. Like they start oh. to tangle and then and then I wake up like I'm like in a straight uh -huh. jacket and, and it's oh, like it's under, yeah. it's over, it's it's everywhere. Somehow mm -hmm. an arm's gotten pulled in. It's not mm -hmm. even through the sleeve hole anymore. I can't wear them anymore. I'm gonna have to of I think course. I'm gonna have to size down to maybe a one X. I don't know. Sure. Sure. <laughs> but it's become and I panic because it oh, feels like yeah. you're being restrained. Of course. Right? So then in the night I'm like, oh my God, what's happening? Yeah. Yeah, I get that. I actually uh, have been talking about, should I just start doing a night shirt? But then I'm I like, I don't know. I think I think my bottom wants to be free, as free as it wants to feel, which well, is you only. Can still have a, you can still have an yeah. underpant on. Yes. Yeah, you're right. Because, I mean, we're going <laughs> to. There has to be an underpant. There can't not be. I'm just, I'm not comfortable. But. Yeah, I think maybe I maybe I just need to put on one of those nightgowns because I do I have at least two. Yeah, I should give it a go. I think you is. should give it a go. It might change your life. I also do. I'm I'm gonna say I'll find you some satin pajamas. Give them a go at least once because they're warmer. I find them I find them warm anyway. And again, you're sure. slipping, you're sliding. That's nice. I do yeah. like that. And hey, look, if we're gonna talk up our own merch, I basically live in those pants. Oh God bless. The pants are good. They the pajama are pants good. are really good. Um, I've been like just back and forth between the two. And now I'm like, I think I might need to look into a third pair. Like, I think that's where I'm at because I'm like, oh, because today I didn't do laundry in the week. So when I went to put on pants today, I was like, I don't have any of those pants. And then in my mind, I'm like, well, then I don't have pants. 
I have so many other pants, but in my mind, I'm like, no, they're not going to be as comfortable. And then I'm like, ah, spoiler that's not alert, how I want to live. I know who runs the store, so <laughs> I can hook you up. To be clear, I have been, uh, I wouldn't say yelled at, but I'd say reprimanded for just randomly placing orders on the Yes. Store. I'm like, what are you doing? Why are you ordering this? I'll send it to you. You I also I'll send it forget. to you at cost. Like you like it's come on. I also forget that she's going to see it. Yeah, I like do there's see no, all the orders. No part of me that considers she's going to see it. So I always think I can just sneak it in and she'll never know and it's like she's always going to know what are you doing? I'm always going to know. I'm yeah. always going to know. Yeah. Yeah, listen, it's very listen, the support is very sweet, but my point is that, you know, I get a certain amount of orders per month. Yeah. But to try things out and whatnot, that again, I, that, it, that it's included in the thing. Like, yeah, anyway, <laughs> we'll talk about this when we're done. You're not, I, your money's no good here. My God, come on. Um, look, let's get into yeah. it. Uh, what you drinking over there? Uh, I'm doing a Slurpee. Oh, fantastic. Oh, as I've mentioned, I, I'm in, I'm knee deep in Sauvignon Blanc and it's, and for some reason, I was going to sing, and I'm proud to be an American. And I, I, I'm not American. I don't know where that came from. I'm, I would say, on the buzz meter. <laughs> yeah. I'm at probably a seven. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Which I, I was also going to say, like, does that song ever accompany wine? I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. Okay. Um, but listen, I'm seeing on my schedule here. You have a quick update. I do. I do. Um, and <laughs> I love that I'm clarifying this. Um, this is news that came out November 8th, okay. which I know by the time this episode releases, because we're recording a little bit earlier than usual, I'm very up to date on this. But like yeah. by <laughs> in the like week, two weeks when it comes out, people are going to be like, well, that's not as new, but it, it's still, most people might not know about it. So in April, 2023, we released episode 122, uh, which featured two cases from Minnesota. Uh, one of those cases has finally received an update after 50 years. Wow. Yeah. So I'm going to give you a, a quick refresher, uh, cause I know they can all tend to, uh, bleed together. Um, Mary Schley, was hitchhiking from Minneapolis to Chicago for an art show in February 1974. Her body was found days later on the side of the road in Springbrook, Wisconsin. Uh, she was just 25 at the time of her death. She had been stabbed at least 15 times. There were defensive wounds to her hands. Um, an eyewitness had reported seeing a man dump a body on the side of the road before quickly fleeing the scene. Police had a few suspects, including Randall Woodfield, who was a former Green Bay Packer, who had later become a serial killer. Uh, but police never had enough evidence to charge him with Mary's murder, so her case went cold. But thanks to an orange and black stocking cap, or a toque for our Canadian friends, um, which was found near Mary's body, police were able to get DNA from or make a DNA profile from the potential killer. Law enforcement now use forensic genetic genealogy and search commercial commercial databases to find a familial match. They'll use it to find um, a match to suspects or victims or even missing persons. It is how they eventually caught the Golden State Killer. Yes. So investigators in this case do the same and they get a match to a woman they reach out to that woman and she offers to give police a sample of her dna it was determined that mary's killer was this woman's biological father <gasps> now this woman was adopted oh so it took a little effort like more effort to kind of track him down but when they finally did they discovered the suspect was 84 year old john miller Miller denied any knowledge of the murder, but when investigators told him that they found his DNA at the scene, 
he fully admitted he was responsible for Mary's death. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Miller, who was 33 at the time of the crime, stated that Mary was was hitchhiking. He picked her up. He then asked her for sexual contact. Oh, That's his wording, not mine. Uh, and Mary turned him down. So Miller grabbed a knife that he had stashed in his car and fatally stabbed Mary more than a dozen times. He said he pulled off the highway and tried to hide her body in a snowbank, but got scared when a car drove by, so he left the body and fled the scene. Miller was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. He is currently awaiting extradition to Wisconsin. While I am relieved that the case is officially solved, I'm horrified to learn that Mary was murdered simply because she turned a man down. I know. No one owes anyone else sex. I just... I can't. I'm horrified. I'm also horrified to think that he did that and then just lived his life for 50 years. Who knows what else he's done? Oh. Was that the first time? Was it the last time? Has he killed anybody since? I, I don't know. Um, but uh, shout out to Becky for uh, tagging us and letting us know uh, about that update. What an update. I mean, yeah. listen, yes, I agree with you. <clears throat> it's always so overwhelming when it's, you know, that's the motive in this crime. And, not a but, and it's also wonderful to hear that something's been solved, even if it's after 50 years. I mean, my goodness, yeah. it feels so nice that uh, her family will get, um, you know, some amount of closure in this situation. Yeah. But I agree with you. Not only do I immediately say, what else has he potentially been doing over the last 50 years? But then it's like, wow, so she had her entire life taken from her and you just got to live out your life carefree. Yeah. No justice. No. I mean, there is justice. There is justice literally, but metaphorically, it feels unjust to me that someone would be able to take a life again so frivolously. Yeah. So frivolously. And, and because she uh, said no, which is absolutely her right to do. Of, of course, because believe it or not, it does not matter the situation. Correct. Believe it or not, it does not matter what the situation is. There's yeah. never, ever a time. No. Well, thank you for that update. That is, again, um, very tragic, but positive, again, that we've gotten some form of closure for such an old cold case. My God. Yeah. Um, but Listen. Let's get into what we're going to talk about today, tonight, this morning. They could be listening at any time. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I don't even nope. know what time it is for us right now. <laughs> I have no idea where I am. And I'm living in the future. Yep. And I'm in the past. So bye-bye. Um, we're talking, of course, about Alexandra Vicharik. Vicharik. Excuse me. It's written out phonetically, and I still cocked it up. Oh, you're on a, you're a seven. You know, I'd be seven and a half, baby. <laughs> um, so sorry. All right. <laughs> Never apologize. Alexandra Vicherik. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, much like I'm not, I'll get you up to speed with this synopsis right now. In the spring of 1962, a young nurse named Alexandra Vicherik disappeared near her home in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. Police did a massive search, but no sign of Alexandra was found. Thirteen days after she first went missing, Alexandra's body was discovered in a shallow grave mere blocks from her house. So what happened to Alexandra Vicherik? Who are the potential suspects? And how is music legend Johnny Cash related to all of this? Christy Oxborough investigates. This is going to be a very Canadian episode. Oh, I could not be happier about it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, the other day I... I, I did a video um, on my Instagram and uh, I was talking about a card and someone was like, when you say card, you sound like Lauren saying Harbor. And Our... I was like, do I? Huh. I never thought I really had an accent, but every once in a while, I guess I got to get the card. And I'm like, Listen, there again, it is. There, there it are is. Certain, there are certain trigger words for me. As we know, Harbor is one yeah. of them. Yeah, I get that. Oh, I just, I was tickled uh, to learn. I love it. I, I didn't, I had no idea. So, uh, 
disclaimer. This episode will contain mentions of rape, child abuse, and child death. So trigger warning for those who need it. Now, this is somewhat of a local case to me um, because it occurred in the province uh, where I've been living for the last 30 years. I'm not going to do that math. I'm not going to yeah. do that math, but like... Well, it was in 1994. It was 30 well, years ago. I moved to Yorkton when I was, I believe, seven turning eight mm -hmm. in the third grade. So 1989, um, 1988. Yeah, I think that sounds about right. So in yeah, 1988. Yeah, because we came, we came to visit in 1990. Yeah, and oh, was I still in Yorkton? But I was because I you moved were. to Regina in 93. Yes. I love that we're hashing out my my timeline. But what? yeah, what is that? Like, uh, well, if 94 was 30 years, this is painful. Uh, if 94 was 30 years, 36 years. So I've lived 36 years in this province. Most of your life. Yeah. There was like a, oh God, I don't know, eight month chunk of that 36 years where I did not live in this province. But that's a long, that's a long time. I don't know why I feel I have to prove I'm, <laughs> I'm I don't know what we're doing or what's going on, but I, I'm here. I support yeah. you. Yeah. And yes. Yeah. I don't know. Again. So uh, the point was, uh, this case is from Saskatchewan, Canada. Um, and even though it occurred in the province uh, that I live in, I had never heard of it before. Uh, so I'm going to shout out Kirsten uh, for uh, giving me the suggestion. Oh, so we are on a very Canadian ride. Brace yourselves. So, Alexandra Vacherik was born April 20th, 1939, in the village of Endeavour, Saskatchewan, Canada, which is about 122 kilometers north of Yorkton or 330 kilometers east of Saskatoon, depending on how well you know the province or not. Alexandra was the youngest of 10 children Oof. born to a religious Ukrainian family. She attended high school at the Technical Institute in Saskatoon. At the time, Alexandra's dream was to be a stewardess. But since she was only five foot one, she was considered too short for the really? job. Huh. Apparently. I did a quick Google and the depends... Depending, each airline seems to have their own specific, you have to be, tw be between this height and this height. Some are just specifically, you can't be taller than this kind hmm. of thing, you know? So, um, so once she realized that was not to be her dream, uh, she set her sights on becoming a nurse. After high school graduation in 1959, Alexandra uh, moved to Yorkton, uh, where she received training from the Yorkton Union Hospital School of Nursing. Her family was incredibly proud because Alexandra was the first one of them to attend post-secondary education. Mm. Throughout her youth, Alexandra won multiple beauty contests. And during her time in Yorkton, Alexandra was crowned queen of the Canet Skating Carnival in 1960. That same year, Alexandra was chosen to represent Yorkton in the province-wide Saskatchewan Wheat Queen Contest. Once again... She was victorious. Alexandra graduated from nursing school in 1961 and moved to Saskatoon, where she shared a basement apartment with three other nurses, Pauline, Alice, and Doreen. In September that year, Alexandra started working at the Saskatoon City Hospital, where she planned to stay until June 1962, after which she was going to quit so that she could spend the entire summer at Emma Lake. But I cannot mention 1961 without getting into the fact that that year, Alexandra met music legend Johnny Cash. Ah. Johnny, of course, was known for such musical staples as Cry, 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 I Walk the Line, Folsom Prison Blues, A Boy Named Sue, Get Rhythm, and of course, Ring of Fire. For whatever reason... My personal favorite, and thank you for asking, was either Time's A-Wastin' or Jackson 
neither of which was written by Johnny Cash, because both were written by his wife, June Carter Cash, and her first husband, Carl Smith. But after they became a couple, Cash and June performed those songs together, and for whatever reason, I really was taken with them. And just like that, I turned a random, unnecessary fun fact into my very first reverse side note. <laughs> I spit all over myself. I was so excited. <laughs> I just also want you to know I, I've written multiple episodes in a in a small span, um, and that's where I'm at. <laughs> You're doing great. That's where I'm at. So, Johnny Cash became famous in the mid '50s. But around the same time, a strapping young man named Elvis burst onto the music scene and Johnny's fame took a bit of a hit. So in 1960, Johnny toured throughout Canada, including Ontario, Newfoundland and Manitoba. While in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Johnny co-wrote a song with Johnny Horton, a rockabilly singer who joined the tour after winning a Grammy the year before. Johnny Horton is most known for hits like North to Alaska, Sink the Bismarck, and The Battle of New Orleans, which won Best Country and Western Recording at the second annual Grammys in November 1959. There you go. Yeah. And if 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 you're like me, I was like, oh, I don't, oh, I'm like, I've never heard of North to Alaska. I'm like, I've never heard of this. And then I was like, Battle of New Orleans in 1814. I took a little, like, my brain just immediately... I was like, why do I know that song? I don't know. Because it won a Grammy, I guess. So during a stop in Winnipeg, Cash comes up with this idea for a song about a guy who was anxious to get home to the girl of his dreams who happened to live in Saskatoon. So together with Horton, the two Johnnies wrote a song called Girl in Saskatoon, which features the line, I'm freezing, but I'm burning." For the girl in Saskatoon. Sadly, Horton died in a car accident in November 1960 at the age of 35. So to honor his friend, Cash recorded the song uh, two weeks after Horton's death, and it was released in December 1960 as a single with the song Locomotive Man on the B-side. So Cash heads back to Canada in 1961 to do more shows, and he decides he wants to do a show in Saskatoon where he's going to serenade a girl because the girl in Saskatoon. A local radio station set up a beauty contest where the winner would be given a dozen roses and brought on stage while Cash sang Girl in Saskatoon. In mid to late 1961, the contest was run and 22-year-old Alexandra Vacherik was named the winner. So she got to join Cash on stage in front of 1,500 fans while he performed with his band, The Tennessee Two. Months later, uh, on May 18th, 1962, Alexandra had a night shift at the hospital starting at 11.30 p.m. Before work, she told her roommates she was going to go to a nearby pharmacy called Mead's Drugs to mail a few letters. Around 8 p.m., Alexandra left her house at 1223 7th Avenue North and headed to Meads, which was 1206 7th Avenue. She was seen at the pharmacy between 8.30 and 8.45 p.m. She bought some stamps and mailed one letter to a friend in Edmonton and a second letter to her sister in Ontario. Alexandra then decided to take a walk along the South Saskatchewan River, which was about a 10-minute walk from the pharmacy. A group of boys who were fishing on the riverbank claimed to have seen Alexandra sometime between 9 and 9.45 p.m. When Alexandra didn't return to the house before her shift at 11.30, her roommates just assumed she went straight from her walk to the hospital. But the hospital called that night looking for Alexandra, and no one had seen her. When Alexandra still hadn't returned the next morning, her roommate Pauline reported her missing at 10.15 a.m. RCMP, or Royal Canadian Mounted Police, immediately put out reports about Alexandra on local radio stations. They got 
so many tips from people who claim to have seen her, including that group of boys who believe they saw Alexandra while they were fishing. So RCMP took a boat along the Saskatchewan River, South Saskatchewan River, um, but they found nothing. On May 23rd, five days after her disappearance, RCMP brought a canine unit to the riverbank area. One of the dogs seemed interested in like one specific area, but they couldn't find anything. So they thought the dog just kind of made a mistake. RCMP circulated Alexandra's photo and her description to police departments in Manitoba, Alberta, British Columbia, and even as far as Quebec, but there was just no sign of Alexandra. According to the Canadian news program, The Fifth Estate, Thank three, you. Yeah, three young boys were fishing in the area about a week after Alexandra went missing. They left the water to go search for worms when one of the boys, who was just five at no. the time, no. saw something strange sticking out of the ground, the boys went home and told their uncle that they found something that they weren't sure what it was, but he didn't believe them and just kind of brushed them off. A week later, the boys finally convinced someone, specifically an older cousin, to return to the scene with them. And that was when the cousin realized the strange item was a human hand. Oh, my God. Police were sent to the area on May 31st, where they discovered the body of Alexandra Vacherik buried in a shallow grave about 100 feet from the water near the CPR bridge. She was, uh, the site was approximately 800 yards from Alexandra's home. Alexandra Vacherik was just 23 at the time oh. of her death. She was described as vibrant, full of life, outgoing, and an incredible person. Her family said uh, Alexandra was such a great girl that she just made everybody happy wherever she went. According to Alexandra's family, when Johnny Cash learned about Alexandra's death, he never performed Girl in Saskatoon in concert again. Really? That's how it goes. Yeah. Interesting. Now, this is the moment I'm going to get into specific details about Alexandra's death. So brace yourselves because this is brutal. Um. Her shirt and bra were ripped down the front. Uh, she was nude from the waist down. She was only wearing her right shoe while the left was found nearby in some bushes. According to the autopsy, she had been raped and there were lacerations on her scalp and face. Mm. Her skull was fractured in two places. And it is believed that Alexandra had been struck with a concrete slab. She was then buried with the concrete slab on her chest. Police Chief Jim Kettles said it was the most brutal scene he had witnessed in his 25-year career. He stated that based on the amount of skin found under Alexandra's fingernails, he believes she put up um, what he said, quote, was a ferocious battle for mm. life. So it seems she was grabbed while on her walk, raped, beaten with a concrete slab, and buried. And since dirt and sand were found in her windpipe, that means she was buried alive. Oh, God. Based on the skull fractures, the medical examiner believes that she was most likely unconscious at the time. Um, her official cause of death was suffocation. Oof. So just uh, top to bottom horrific. Yeah. The... Medical examiner estimates that her time of death was sometime between 8.30 and 11 p.m. on May 18th. We know that Alexandra left her house around 8 p.m. and that she was seen at the pharmacy between 8.30 and 8.45, took that 10-minute walk to the river where she was seen by a group of boys between 9 and 9.45. So did she walk for a while, then get attacked on her way back? But also... What ages were the boys who allegedly saw her? Are we talking children? Are we talking teenagers? Were they properly questioned as suspects as they might have been some of the last people to see her alive? And do we know for sure that it was Alexandra that they saw that night? Also, 
three more things about the scene worth noting. One, Alexandra's wallet, to this day, has never been found. Two, the spot where Alexandra was buried is the same spot where the canine sniffer dog alerted their handler. No. So I don't know why they didn't find her sooner. Um, and third, it rained at some point between the night of the murder and the day her body was found. So that could absolutely interfere with evidence, not to mention the area she was found was well-traveled. Um, and since she wasn't found for 13 days, that crime scene was so badly contaminated by the time police got to it. Um, but 131 officers from the Saskatoon Police and RCMP immediately started investigating. They did an extensive door-to-door -door campaign throughout the city park neighborhood where Alexandra lived. They interviewed hundreds of people, including family and friends. Um, they spoke with taxi drivers. They spoke with the staff at every airport, bus terminal, and train station, hoping to find someone suspicious who may have quickly left the city after Alexandra's death. They created a file that contained 1,100 names for the police to track down. Uh, don't worry. Uh, some of those were like witnesses. So we're not talking like 1,100 suspects because that I can't even begin to think about. Um, the police reached out to other law agencies across the country to have them interview potential suspects who had long since left Saskatoon. They even reached out to Scotland Yard and had them interview a suspect at their request. So several people um, reported seeing a red sports car or some sort of red vehicle in the city park area on the night of Alexandra's murder. But as of this record, that vehicle has never been found. During the investigation, police released a sketch of a 13-year-old boy who was believed to have valuable information about the murder. The boy was allegedly fishing in the area on the night of the murder. As far as I know, that boy was never identified. I don't know if that boy was ever, was like fishing by himself. Did that group of boys say there was another boy there? I don't know. Um, overall, the police took more than 600 statements throughout their investigation, but the case soon went cold. A cold case investigator reopened the case in the 90s, uh, but discovered that much of the evidence had been lost. Uh, some, some blame police corruption. Others suggest a simple mishandling of the case. Only some of Alexandra's clothing remained, along with the concrete slab found on her body, and three broken beer bottles that were found at the scene because, you know, they collect everything just in case. Uh, unfortunately, the investigation didn't get any further then than it had three decades before. So in 2004, Alexandra's body was exhumed. The medical examiner found reddish brown hairs in Alexandra's hand that were missed during the original autopsy. Investigators were able to use the hairs to build a DNA profile of the killer. Throughout multiple investigations, police have considered more than 50 persons of interest. Uh, but thanks to that DNA profile, police were able to exclude multiple suspects, including Billy McGaffin, who was a redheaded boy who claimed to have seen Alexandra near the river on the night of her death. So was Billy one of the boys in that group? Because if so... Well, that answers my question about whether police spoke to that group as suspects or not. Right. But they've never said one way or the other. Um, there were rumors that a local doctor was involved, but police have not said whether that person is still a suspect or not. Uh, police also questioned Hugh Carlton. Uh, he was in a casual relationship with Alexandra at the time of her death. He had called her house that evening to see if they if he could drive her to work, but her roommate said she wasn't home. The next day, uh, which was a Saturday, Hugh and some friends headed to Waskasu for the weekend. Waskasu is a very popular lake about 230 kilometers north of Saskatoon. Police found it suspicious that Hugh left town so quickly after Alexandra disappeared, 
Um, and I'm not saying it is one way or the other, but I will add the trip was scheduled long in advance. So it wasn't a ra random running out of guilt. Um, it was also the Victoria Day long weekend. Uh, so it's not surprising that people would be getting out of town. Um, I will say from my personal experience, a lake in Saskatchewan isn't typically warm enough to go in in May. Does this mean that I'm going to look into the temperatures from that weekend in May 1962? Of course it is, because it turns out the high that day would have been about 25 degrees Celsius, which is about 77 Fahrenheit. So decent enough day. I just don't know if the water would have been warm enough, but that doesn't mean you're not going to go to the lake to just hang out. Um, police have not publicly stated whether or not Hugh is still considered a suspect. They've also never said out loud if uh, the DNA ever specifically cleared him. I assume if it hadn't, they would have arrested him. But right. who knows? Uh, they, they accused the canine dog of uh, <laughs> being wrong. <laughs> it wasn't. So that dog should get an apology anyway. Yes. I already wrote that down. I already wrote that down. I'm not even kidding. I was like, justice yeah. for that dog. It did its job. Yes. And it didn't pay attention properly. I feel I can't. I can't think about it. it. But yeah, that dog deserved it. Yeah, the dog did its job. It it, de it deserved acknowledgement. Yes. Um, but uh, speaking of people that Alexandra may have been romantically linked to. Mm. Now, there was a rumor that she was seeing Colin Thatcher, who was the son of a local politician. Quick aside about Colin for the non-Canadian political junkies out there. Colin's father, Ross Thatcher, was a former member of parliament and the premier of Saskatchewan from 1964 to 1971. Uh, in American speak, uh, he was like the governor. So in 1975, Colin decides he's going to go into politics, and he served as a liberal MLA and then Saskatchewan's Minister of Energy in 1982. He resigned that role in January 1983, citing financial and family issues. What are those? <laughs> We're going to get into it. Hell so, yeah. Was... Alexandra really dating Colin Thatcher? I don't know. Um, at the time, Colin and his family lived in Saskatchewan, but during the academic year, Colin was attending Iowa State University, where he was dating a girl named Joanne Geiger. In fact, Colin and Joanne got married in August 1962, just three months after Alexandra's death. And while some may say, well, see, it's proof. They couldn't have been uh, romantically linked. It's just a rumor because Colin was was dating Joanne and even married her. Well, Colin has a history of infidelity. In fact, he openly admits that infidelity is what led to him and Joanne getting divorced in 1979. They went through an ugly custody battle during which Joanne was awarded custody of two of the couple's three children, as well as $820,000. Mm. In January 1981, Joanne got remarried and changed her name to Joanne Wilson. Four months later, Joanne was shot in the kitchen of her home in Regina, Saskatchewan. She spent three weeks in hospital, but did survive. Police determined that Joanne had been shot with a high-powered rifle through her kitchen window. As of this record, no one has ever been charged with that shooting. Then Whoa. nearly yeah, then nearly 2 years later, in January 1983, Joanne was found bludgeoned and shot in her garage. She suffered 27 wounds, a broken arm, a fractured wrist, and a severed finger. After being severely beaten, Joanne was then shot once in the head. She was 43 at the time of her death, which occurred just four days after Colin resigned as the Minister of Energy 
stating financial and familial issues. Whoa. Police believe that Colin hired someone to kill his ex-wife, and he was arrested in the fall of 1984 on charges of first-degree murder. An ex-girlfriend testified against Colin, saying he repeatedly told her how much he hated Joanne and he wanted to kill her or hire someone to kill her. Colin was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole for 25 years. He maintained his innocence and filed multiple appeals. Colin was paroled 22 years later in November 2006 when he was 68 years old. He told reporters his plan after getting out of prison was to work as a ranch hand on his family's ranch near Moose Jaw. And as someone who lives in Moose Jaw, let me say, ha ha, no thanks, Call. I mean, it happened years ago and all of us locals know exactly who he is. I'm just not a fan of the proximity. Um, but not everyone feels that way because in 2022, a member of the Sask Party invited dear old Colin to a tough on crime speech at the legislator legislature sorry uh inviting a convicted murderer to a speech about being tough on crime feels insane yeah um the dope who invited colin said he considered colin a friend and that he'd had a tough life because of his time in prison because he was a convicted murderer. Mm. He also added, quote, if anyone has a right to be here, it's Colin Thatcher. Why? I don't know. And it's also, it was violence, against, like a, a deep, deep violence against a woman. So stand down. It's all I'm yes. saying. Stand down. Um, I honestly wish I had more time to rage about this, uh, but I don't. Um, so Colin remarried in 2010 while he was still on parole for murdering his ex-wife. Um, his new wife, Sandra, was the secretary treasurer of the Colin Thatcher Defense Fund for more than 20 years. Oh, boy. Uh, while he was fighting for his appeal. But this somehow was Colin's third marriage because he married a woman named Bev while he was incarcerated in Edmonton in 1994. Bev started sending Colin letters after seeing a TV movie based on Joanne's murder. Colin and Bev divorced a year later. Colin referred to the marriage as an embarrassment. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, I just can't imagine seeing that movie and going, well, he's single. <sighs> as far as I can tell, police have never outright excluded Colin Thatcher as a suspect in Alexandra Vacherik's murder. And if you're thinking, whoa, Christy, <laughs> that was a lot of information on just one potential suspect. You're right. And thank you for noticing. But hold on to your butts because I still have five suspects to go. And four of them include detailed backstories because this bitch don't know when to quit. Again, I, <laughs> I again, this is our, our, our third episode record in a, about a week's time. We're killing it, man. You're on fire. I'm loaded. <laughs> this is what the people come for. <laughs> God, I pray this is considered on fire because I don't even know what I'm doing anymore. So the next person considered as a suspect in Alexandra's case was John Hind, a local man who was supposed who was the supposed ringleader of a group of boys who attempted to drag a woman into their car in Saskatoon in 1958. That is, of course, four years before Alexandra's death. Um when Hind was told he was a potential suspect, he said any connection between him and Alexandra's case was bullshit. He was 19 at the time. Um, you know, he was 19 at the time of Alexandra's death, but he was only 15 
when he was the ringleader of some teens who tried to grab a woman off the street. Oh, boy. Um, but if you ask him about that incident, about, you know, trying to grab a woman off the street, Hind said the whole thing was, quote, just a lark. Which uh, Bet it might wasn't be, for her. Nope. Uh, it might be one of the most horrifying ways to describe any violence against a woman. Uh, Hind passed away in 2023 at the age of 79. From the best I can tell, Saskatoon police eliminated Hind as a suspect. Another person, once considered a suspect in Alexandra's case, was Leslie Clausen. Clausen lived in Saskatoon in 1962. Even though he was only 19 at the time... Uh, he'd already served jail time for multiple sex offenses, which started back in 1960. Uh, the offenses included two indecent assaults and five convictions of indecent exposure. In February 1974, Clausen raped a 15-year-old girl. Clausen claims it was consensual, uh, but since he was 31 at the time, um, it wasn't legal. Uh, the girl's body was later found buried in a snowbank, having suffered a blow to the head. Clausen claims the girl's death was an accident, saying she fell backwards and hit her head on the concrete during sex. Oh. Mm -hmm. Clausen pleaded guilty to criminal negligence causing death and was sentenced to six years. Stop. And typically, he would have been released a few years later. But in 1977, Clausen was labeled a dangerous sex offender since by then he had 30 offenses on his record. So because of that label and the fact that he refused to participate in any treatment programs and stopped seeing the prison psychiatrist, Clausen has continually been denied parole and by the time he was 74, Clausen had spent 43 years behind bars for various violent offenses. From the best I can tell, he is still in prison. But he has been cleared of Alexandra's murder thanks to DNA. Mm. In an interview with the Fifth Estate, Clausen said, in his opinion, he believes Alexandra was killed either by an acquaintance of hers or by someone who had been watching her every day and knew where she liked to walk. Clausen added, quote, thoughts sometimes lead to actions. That's been my experience anyway. Chilling coming from a repeat offender. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So if anybody's like, would you ever want to interview? So nope. This right here is why. No, no, we're good. Cause I'm, never going to sleep again if I have someone say that to my face. I barely never. will just hearing it. Yeah, there it is. Uh, and because the horror show Onslaught of Suspects does not quit, another suspect on the list was Clifford Olson. He was convicted in October 1961 for various minor crimes and sentenced to several months in the Prince Albert Penitentiary, Penitentiary which is about 138 kilometers northeast of Saskatoon. During his time there, um, he, he was stabbed seven times by a group of fellow inmates because he informed on their plans to smuggle drugs into the prison. Mm. Olson was released in April 1962 when he was 21 years old. Alexandra was murdered about a month later, but it's unknown how long Olson was in the area following his release. At some point, he moved to British Columbia, where he spent nearly 20 years in prison for more than 90 convictions. Oof. Following his release in September 1980, he then just went on an eight-month killing spree during which he murdered 11 children between the ages of 9 and 17. Mm. Olson came to be known as the Beast of British Columbia. He was arrested in August 1981, and he struck a deal 
that he would confess to the 11 murders and show police where the locations of the remains they hadn't found were. Uh, in exchange, police would put $10,000 for each victim found into a trust account for his wife and newborn son. I remember this. His wife eventually received $100,000, which is equivalent to about 348000 in 2024. They don't do those deals anymore, I don't I don't think. believe so. It was yeah. very odd, and uh, people were outraged. Yeah. People were absolutely outraged. I mean, as well they should be. Oh, 100%. I'm not saying... Um, I mean, I can't imagine you find out, you just have a baby and then find out your husband is murdered children and is going away. But I can't imagine what's going to happen to her. But to to give her money because he murdered those children while the family's got nothing and lost a family member. Like, I, it's, yeah, I get why people were outraged. Yes. I get it. Same. So. Olson pleaded guilty to 11 counts of murder and was given 11 life sentences to be served concurrently. He was sent to a supermax facility in Quebec, where he died from cancer in 2011 at the Too age bad. of 71. Too bad. Yeah, sometimes cancer gets it right. Yep. I said what I said. <laughs> <laughs> when it's that level of evil... He, he killed he 11 does. children. I have no problem saying I'm happy he's dead. I, <laughs> he I deserves, feel fine about it. He deserved, yeah. uh, he Absolutely. deserved that cancer. Yep, I hope he rots. So, next on the suspect list um, is infamous in Canada, especially Saskatchewan. It's a guy named Larry Fisher. Now, on January 31st, 1969, a 20-year-old nurse's aide named Gail Miller left her house in the Pleasant Hill area of Saskatoon shortly after 6.45 a.m. She was last seen waiting to catch a bus wearing her nurse's uniform. An hour and a half later, Gail's body was found two blocks away, lying face down in a snowbank in an alley. She had been raped, beaten, and stabbed. A six-inch paring knife, which was missing the handle, was discovered under Gail's body. An autopsy report revealed that Gail had been stabbed 12 times in the chest, back, and collarbone. Her face and throat had been cut, and her knees had been bruised. A few days after the murder, Gail's purse and the handle of the knife were discovered in a garbage can blocks away. <laughs> That same day, police spotted Larry Fisher waiting for the bus where Gail was last seen. They spoke with Fisher, but since he lived in the area, they found nothing unusual about him being there. Three months later, in May 1969, Albert Cadrain contacted the police to say he felt that his friend had been acting suspiciously and had so on the morning of Gail's murder. So police interviewed Albert's friend, who was 16-year-old David Milgard, who denied any knowledge of the crime. At the time of the murder, David and two of his friends were on a road trip across Canada. They had traveled from Regina to Saskatoon on the day of Gail's death, arriving at Albert's house around 9 a.m. But since Albert's house was near the location where Gail's body was found, Police were suspicious of David, even though he was with his friends at the time of the murder. But then those two friends were coerced by police into giving false confessions, claiming that they saw David with blood on his clothing hours after Gail's murder. And then later, one of those friends even claimed that she witnessed David stabbing Gail. David was soon arrested and eventually found guilty of Gail's murder. He was just 17 at the time and sentenced to life in prison. David maintained his innocence and spent years trying to clear his name. He filed an official appeal in 1988, but it was not considered until 1991. 
Thanks to advances in DNA technology, the DNA on the victim was tested and found to not be David Milgard. Oof. He was released from prison in 1992 after serving 23 years for a crime he didn't commit. Oof. The Saskatchewan government later awarded David $10 million for pain, suffering, lost wages, and legal fees. The same DNA evidence that exonerated David was found to be a match to Larry Fisher, the same man who police interviewed just three days after the crime. Ugh. It turns out, at the time of Gail's murder, Fisher and his wife were renting the basement of Albert Cadrain's home. Oh, my God. The yeah. very man who accused David Milgard of the crime. Again, him and two friends arrived in town at 9 a.m. She went missing before 7. I get that they get pressured to close high-profile cases, but you put a 17-year-old in prison. For 23 years. It's, I, I God. Fisher was arrested in 1997 for Gail's murder and convicted in January 2000 and sentenced to life in prison. But even if we take away David's wrongful imprisonment and the fact that his supposed friends gave false testimony against him and were coerced by the police, if we take all of that away, this case is an absolute horror show because in 1980, after David had been in prison for about a decade, Fisher's then-wife Linda went to the police and told them she believed her husband was the one responsible for the death of Gail Miller. But the Saskatchewan Police Department did not follow up with her. Mm -hmm. If they had, David Milgard may have been released, you know, more than a decade before Jeez. he was. Uh, another horror show, um, since it took police 28 years to realize Larry Fisher was the real killer, it left Fisher free to commit several other rapes. Um, the 28 years he, uh, the 28 years between when Gail was murdered and when he was actually arrested for it, um, Fisher spent 23 of those years in prison for seven other sexual assault convictions, four of which occurred after Gail's death. So uh, uh, there were also five unsolved rapes occurred that occurred in Saskatoon between 1968 and February 1969. And I am convinced Fisher was the culprit um, because a few of those attacks occurred in the same area as some of his other crimes. But uh, Fisher said... When it came to the attacks, he was looking for a way to seek power and control, and oh, sex was the way he got it. Ugh. This is why I don't want to speak to them personally. Um, he said that a pounding would begin in his head, and the only way he could get relief was to exert power over a woman. Fisher wow. admitted to stalking his victims and said they were often chosen at random, uh, he claimed that he was sexually and physically abused as a child and that when he went to a hospital and told nurses what was happening to him at home, they didn't believe him. So part of me wonders if that caused him to be angry towards nurses in general and if that's uh, why he specifically went after Gail because she was wearing a nurse's uniform at the time of her death. And given this potential anger towards nurses and Fisher's overall M.O., it was suggested he might be responsible for Alexandra's murder. But at the time, Fisher would have been 13. Uh, but since, I mean, since Alexandra was only 5'1", it's possible that a younger teenager could have been responsible. But Fisher was living in North Battleford, which is like 135 kilometers northwest of Saskatoon, so it does seem unlikely uh, that he could have been responsible for Alexandra's murder. Thanks to DNA evidence, Fisher was officially eliminated as a suspect in the case. 
he's still an absolute piece of shit. Just not yes. this particular piece of shit that we're looking for. Right. Larry Fisher passed away in June 2015 at the age of 65. And David Milgard passed away in May 2022 at the age of 69. I guess if there is anything positive we can say here, it's that Fisher died in prison. Well, David did not. Yeah. And the final suspect uh, that was allegedly linked to Alexandra's case is a local man that I'm just going to refer to as Clark. There are a lot of rumors uh, in the community that Clark was involved. But uh, keep in mind, just speculation. Uh, but what is it about Clark that would put him on people's radar? Well, Clark and his family lived at 1224 Sixth Avenue, which would have put him directly across the back alley from Alexandra's house at 1223 Seventh Avenue. Was it literally just proximity that made people skeptical? Sort of. Um, that and the fact that he was linked to a violent crime 36 years prior. Now, according to a book written by Clark's son, after Alexandra's murder, Clark picked his son up and told him he was worried police would suspect him of Alexandra's murder because of something in Clark's past. And this is a moment when he, like, told the kid a story that this kid, I don't even know how old this kid was at the time he learned it, um, but he told him a story of his past, which, um, brace yourselves, it's horrific. Oh, boy. So when Clark was just 13, his mother sent him to live with his uncle, Gordon Northcutt, uh, who ran a farm in California. Northcutt moved with his parents from Canada to Los Angeles, California in 1924. Two years later, when Northcutt turned 19, he asked his father to buy a plot of land in Wineville, which is part of Riverside County. Uh, Northcutt built a house and a chicken ranch on the property and then asked his sister to send 13-year-old Clark to come help him. She did so willingly. Unfortunately, asking for help was just a ruse because Northcutt then just spent the next two years physically and sexually abusing his nephew. Oh. When Clark's sister came to visit in August 1928, Clark told her he feared for his life and said that Northcutt had murdered at least four children. When his sister returned home, she contacted the American consulate who then wrote a letter to the Los Angeles Police Department. Northcutt and his mother, Sarah, were arrested in November 1928. Clark testified that Northcutt had beaten, molested, and murdered three boys under the age of 12 with the help of Clark and Northcutt's mother, Sarah. So yes, not only did Northcutt abuse Clark, but he also forced him to participate in the murders. Oh, my God. Quick lime was used to dispose of the remains that were buried on the property. Three shallow graves were found on the ranch, but the bodies had been removed by the time the police got there. In the graves, police found body parts, personal effects belonging to the victims, and blood-stained axes. Clark claims the bodies had been moved to a spot in the desert. The true number of victims is not known. Uh, especially since there were times when Northcutt would grab a child, abuse them, and then just send them home. It is believed the number of victims could be as high as 20. Northcutt was found guilty on three counts of first-degree murder and executed in October 1930. His mother, Sarah, pleaded guilty to a fourth boy, uh, nine-year-old Walter Collins, Walter went missing in March 1928 after a trip to the movies. Five months later, a boy arrived at the police station claiming to be Walter. Walter's mother, Christine, said, that's not my son. But the police captain, who was desperate to solve that case, told Christine, ah, 
take him home and try the boy out. Stop. Christine went back to the police three weeks later and said, yeah, I was right. This boy is absolutely not my son. So the police captain responded by having Christine committed to a mental hospital for 10 days until that child confessed, yeah, no, he actually was not her son. He was actually a 12-year-old runaway from Iowa named Arthur Hutchins Jr. Sarah confessed to killing Walter months later. Uh, Walter's story was the basis for the 2008 movie Changeling, starring Angelina Jolie. Mm. Sarah was sent to prison for 12 years for Walter's death. She was paroled in 1940 and died four years later at the age of 75. With the negative press surrounding the area, um, after all this came out, the town changed its name from Wineville to uh, Mira Loma. Clark, who was an unwilling accomplice in all of this, was sentenced to five years at a reformatory. Uh, it was later, commu later commuted to 23 months, after which Clark was sent back to Saskatchewan, where he became a model citizen. He worked at the post office. He got married. He served during World War II, adopted two children. But the guilt of what he went through in California stayed with him. To be clear, Clark was absolutely a victim in all of this. I can't imagine how horrific and traumatizing the time on that farm was for him. But due to this traumatic past, police allegedly interviewed Clark multiple times regarding Alexandra's murder. And while I understand that they need to check every lead and the killers, uh, I mean, killers often have some level of abuse in their childhoods. I'm just kind of surprised Clark was considered a suspect at all. Uh, maybe I'm just naive. I just don't believe Clark was involved uh, just because he happened to live near Alexandra. A lot of people lived in that area and could have seen her every day. I just think it's interesting that police zeroed in on Clark when in Gail Miller's case seven years later, those same police officers zeroed in on one person who happened to be in the area briefly and not the actual killer who lived in that area in the same house that the supposed suspect visited so briefly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Clark died in June 1991 at the age of 78. In May 2008, um, oh, also I should point out, um, police have never publicly said whether Clark, whether they're, they won't say whether he's a suspect or not, because of course it's an ongoing investigation. They're trying to keep it and not say anything. Um, but he hasn't been outright said that, they have an outright said that he's not, that he was excluded because of DNA. But if he wasn't, they, I just think if his DNA matched, they would have been screaming from the rooftops. So in May 2008, four of Alexandra's nieces, who were all very young uh, at the time of their aunt's death, started to independently investigate the case themselves. They have interviewed hundreds of people and have come up with four of their own suspects. Five months later, um, the nieces put up a billboard in downtown Saskatoon on the corner of 25th Street and 2nd Avenue. The billboard asked for any tips or information about Alexandra's death and listed a toll-free phone number. Within the first week of the billboard being up, they received more than 40 calls. The nieces currently live in Alberta, BC, and New York, so they all make frequent trips to Saskatoon to follow up on any leads. The police announced in May 2024 that they maintain contact with Alexandra's family and that they are still actively investigating the case. Alexandra Vacherik's death is the oldest cold case still being investigated by the Saskatoon police. But as of this record, no arrests have been made and Alexandra's case remains unsolved. Reporting for True Crime and Cocktails, I'm also from Saskatchewan. 
What a gift to all of us. Uh, listen, I got lots I want to talk about here. So let's yeah. hit the can, grab a drink, and we'll be back to discuss the Alexandra Vacherik case on this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. Clap two on three. One, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're, of course, discussing the Alexandra Vacherik case. Um, listen, what a wild ride. Yeah. 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 I have uh, lots of things I want to talk about here. First of all, I loved getting to talk about uh, Saskatchewan so much because uh, I've obviously spent a lot of time there, not as much as you, uh, but visiting you. So this is this is an absolute delight. I also love, may he rest, Johnny Horton. Can there be more of a Canadian last name? I mean, Tim Hortons, it feels... Oh, sure. Feels really... For sure. ...on the nose. Um Here's something I want to put out there, and I want to preface this by saying I love Johnny Cash. I love his work. Fan. Sure. I love his version of You Are My Sunshine. It makes me cry. Of also, course. I like that on the recording of it, they were like, hey, you finished early. Do you want to do the additional verse? And he responded, and I quote, when my song is sung, my song is sung. And I quote that a lot. I quote that a lot. Because I <laughs> know that I... feeling. I, I know hope, that feeling when it's like, nope, that's what it was. And it's over yeah. now. Yeah. And I hope that when you quote it, you do so in his voice. I don't know if I have. So sorry. I just got such a wave of the smell of Doritos. And there isn't any in the room. That was really weird. I'm like, is it a ghost? And if so, a Doritos ghost, will you share your snacks? That was really <laughs> weird. I'm so sorry. I would not normally have. It was just like so pungent. Oh, that was really bizarre. I'm so sorry. Listen, I, I, as people know, if you listen to the show long enough, I feel like I have a little bit of the gift and I feel like that means something. But anyway, um, well, and interesting, because this is what I was about to say. Maybe this is some sort of message. I don't know why it would be Doritos, but that's neither here nor there. Um, Johnny Cash writes this song with Johnny Horton. Yeah. Who dies shortly after. Yeah. Johnny Cash plays that song. Alexandra is the winner of the contest that he's going to serenade. Mm -hmm. She dies shortly after. Now, I'm not suggesting Johnny Cash murdered these people. He obviously didn't. But what I'm saying is, is there a curse of Johnny Cash episode? Are there more deaths connected to Johnny Cash? Oh, well, I mean... If I if I did a Johnny Cash episode, I'd I'd have to get into abuse allegations, physical wow. abuse. I do believe. Oh sure, you know, um, yeah. But cursed songs. I just feel like are there more deaths we can connect to him? I mean, it's 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 odd to have two, like linked to one song it's also right? just interesting that one death was like i'm gonna honor them by playing it and then a second death it's i'm gonna honor them by not playing it and where do the doritos come in <laughs> i mean i think memory. we're all thinking about doritos at this point i wouldn't i wouldn't say no to some cool ranch anyway that was just what popped into my mind is that i was like are there more deaths connected to him or other songs of his i mean listen could be worth a google yes um when you said that Alexandra's wallet had never been found, I just wrote down trophy as though I'm an FBI profiler. <laughs> I as mean, though I have the nerve. Oh, you'd have the nerve. Yeah, I would. I would. Uh, then I wrote dog alerted, but ignored hashtag justice for that dog. Yes. Cause here's what I don't like about it. I don't like when they write off the working dogs. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Listen, they may not all be perfect all the time. I'm not suggesting that. Sure. But when they do do their job and the people are like, oh, he's wrong. That makes me, that makes my blood boil because they can't talk to you. Correct. They're using the only language that they have. Yeah. And the one that like you literally trained them in. You trained them in it. They succeeded. And then you still, I don't, I can't, I get, I, I'm too defensive of the dogs. Oh, that poor dog would have been like, well, where's my treat? I did what I was supposed to do. Right. And this is also years ago, like where I'm sure the technology is, has, has only improved. The training has only improved. Here's a question I have. Yeah. So she died in 1962. Correct. Her body was exhumed in 2004. 
Yes. So that is, oh, why do I try and do math on the fly? 42 years later, right? Yeah. I'm going to trust that. Yep. 42 years later, her body was exhumed and there were hairs found in her hand that were missed the first time. I have a few follow-up questions about this. Yeah. One, how? Two, what was the state of decomposition of the body 40 years later that they were still able to find these hairs in her hand? Because what I want to say, as someone who has absolutely no right to comment because I don't do it as a job and I don't know if what I'm about to say is true or false, it feels like... If they were, if the hairs were still there 40 years later after the flesh and et cetera yeah. has changed, then sure. they must have been really obvious the first go. Wouldn't you think? You would think so. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. That just, that but struck great that question. Stuck out to me. That stuck out to me. And then I would also say, um, let's go through the list of suspects, see what color hair they have. Yeah. It's not a, it's not a smoking gun. It's not proof, but listen, that would be where I would start. See, it, does anyone have red hair that matches? Let's DNA test those people, you know? Yeah. Um, oh my God. This story of Colin Thatcher's wife. Oh my God. Yeah. Is so horrific. The fact also, like, he was paroled, Colin Thatcher was paroled at 68 and said he planned to work as a ranch hand. Now, I don't want to say anything that is ageist, but are there a lot of 68-year-old ranch hands that are getting into it for the first time at age 68? Like, I, I feel like the so. people who are working on farms that may be still working at that age have been working them their lives. Like, they know what they're doing. Yeah. They have the physical ability. I just feel like, again, I'm like, I don't know that I would be like, that's the person that I'd want to hire. A man who's almost 70. Yeah. And is, I, I is he even working out in prison? I mean, who knows? I just feel like he felt he needed to come up with like, this is what I'm going to do. Sound Something that sounds really innocent instead mm -hmm. of just, I'm just going to go do nothing. Yeah. Great point. Like, I just can't envision anything else. I don't know. I also could have added as a as a side note, or I guess it's more of a fun fact because it's short. Uh, one of the main roads here in town is named after Colin's father. Hmm. So every single time I go on Thatcher Drive, I think about Colin. Never considered his father. In fact, I was shocked to hear his name was Ross. Hmm. Technically a middle name, but I believe his right. first name is like Wilbert or something. Well, I they went by Ross. middle name too. Yeah, I get that. Right. Um, no offense to any Wilberts listening. Do we have any Wilberts listening? Reach out. If there is anyone who is legally named Wilbert listening to this episode of the show, let us know. Yeah. Sure, why not? I'm just curious. I'd love to see, like, is that a common name somewhere else in the world? Is it a common name used at all now? Great question. Um, you're going to love the next thing I have to comment on. So Colin remarried in 2010. Yeah. That was short lived. Then remarried, uh, the, the, the treasurer or whatever her title was at the Colin Thatcher defense fund. And to oh, that, I just want to say. He married her in 2010. He married. Excuse me. And he had previously been married to Bev. He married excuse a me. woman in prison. Bev, Bev. Yeah. Yes. Pardon me. You're right. Um, obviously. Uh, it, it doesn't change my point, which is what I love is that a man who is in prison for murdering his, his ex-wife yep. can be remarried more than once. More than once. Yeah. Oh. I don't feel like you hear it the other way around, do you? Now, first of all, there aren't as many women in, in prison, statistically speaking, for those kinds of crimes. Sure. But I just feel like it's like, man, oh, man, ladies... Oh, they all believe he's innocent. Yeah. And or he'll mm -hmm. treat them differently or whatever. And listen, I can't judge it because, listen, we're all fed a steady diet of patriarchy from the time we're born. 
Of course. Uh, we don't have to get into that now. But it just never ceases to amaze me that it's like any man can be in prison for any horrific crime. Serial killers, we know this, and is pick of wives. Oh, yeah. And then you can yeah. find successful, beautiful, talented women can't get married once. Yeah. But I digress. Um, all right. We're getting into the... <clears throat> excuse me. We're getting into the suspects in Alexandra's murder. And as you were going through these, there was I was like, okay, yeah, all right, whatever. Larry Fisher, the MO is identical. Yep. Identical. And I understand that he was very young at the time of Alexandra's murder and and you know, potentially was far enough away that it wasn't him. Um it's just fascinating to me, not only the the correlation that they're both nurses and he had this situation with nurses as a kid yep but also just the car the, the crime itself the stabbing the the lacerations to the the scalp face like yep. all of the details like it was the only one as you were listing all of these that i was like oh that mo matches but again we don't have you know confirmation where he was or wasn't at that time and he Correct. was quite young so hard to say it is interesting, though, that the police were searching for a 13-year-old boy who was in the area or knew who had they believed had valuable information. Right. Great point. Very great point. Was he a part of that gang? Yeah, he could have. Not a he, gang. The group I mean, of boys. Yeah, he could. It's possible he could have been there. I don't know. Right. I mean, Again, we did, he has, was, has he been alibied out? It's not like he was in a different... Um. He wasn't in like a different province. He wasn't in a different country. He was close enough. He could have been. And I know DNA excluded him, but do we maybe question the DNA? Well, here's the other thing I would pose there. Speculating. We know that he and enc she encountered a group of boys. Yes. We don't know a lot about that group of boys. Um, Is it possible more than one was involved? Oh, Absolutely. So the DNA that they found could have matched someone else in, that was a part of this. And either more than one of them actually committed the murder or you know what I'm saying. It's like the DNA was left yeah. by one, but then the murder was done by another one. All I'm saying is I, I don't personally feel like I've heard anything that could 100% exonerate him. Because, again, if he's younger, and we heard about this other group of boys that were trying to, like, pull a woman into a car, yeah. right? So, again, it's like if there's this group mentality, she was also tiny. So, to your point, it's like she's a five-foot-one woman if there's more than one of them, especially. any. I think anything, I wouldn't personally, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't let the DNA be like, oh, that gets him off scot-free like i don't not when the mo's are that close right yeah, yeah it doesn't sit right with me in my gut and i also just have to say the fact that larry fisher that 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 david uh milgard went mm -hmm. to, to jail for the the murder of gail miller Larry's Larry Fisher's wife goes to the police 10 years later saying she is she is fairly sure that he killed this woman. And they said, no, they didn't listen. But they believed Albert. Like, yeah. and there's another time and I'll get to it in a minute, but I'm like. Look, this is just holdover from the from the last episode we recorded and me raging against the <laughs> the machine and, and anti patriarchy pro feminism. But like, sure. It's infuriating to me that women are going to the police, and this is not just this time period and not just this situation. Correct. We hear it again and again. Women are going to the police and saying, hey, there's this thing happening, and the police are going, okay, and patting them on the head. And then, of course, it turns out that they're right. Yeah. But yet they take the word of these men that is not true. Again, we hear it over and over again in this genre. It's, 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 if we aren't going to, like, listen, I'll be on my soap, soapbox for 30 seconds and I promise I'll get off. But there is a correlation in my mind and opinion when you, when you ingest enough true crime, which we do at this point and have. I yeah. feel like at this point, we've been doing this for four years. 
I was ingesting so much of it before then, but I'm like, it really is a commonality that women are just not believed. And that's not a hot take. That's obviously been, we know this for a long time, but like in this, con in this context, it's not only them be not being believed about their own violations is my point. It's that yeah. women are just not believed across the board. So when Correct. women go in and say, Hey, I think this thing happened. They're like, okay. But then a guy will go in and be like, I'm innocent. And they're like, he seems trustworthy. And it's like, it's so infuriating that we I hear know. it again and again and again. To what end? Oh, it's exhausting. It's exhausting. I'm just, I'm tired. That's what it is. I'm exhausted. You've, you've labeled yes. it. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. It's infuriating. Yes. I think it's an it's a, it's another factor because people are always like, why do women like the true crime genre so much? And I'm like, I it's it's again, it speaks to all of our experiences because we all know what it's like to walk down the street alone after dark. Yep. Which is, which is by the way, an experience that a straight, you know, cis man or just cis men in general don't really deal with. I mean, yes, obviously we can get into LGBTQ plus. Obviously, there's a another layer of danger there, but but again, just in terms of randomly walking down the street it is yeah. something that women experience that men typically don't that feeling of fear and again yeah. i think another factor one of the other reasons why women are into true crime is again because we all have the shared experience of there being times where we're not believed all of us have experienced it any woman yes across the board oh 100 percent. look um, there's a reason that i'm terrified of driving uh downtown at night and the whole time, even though I'm driving to my sanctuary, a.k.a. 7-Eleven, and I'm headed there, I go there, well lit, all of that sort of thing, pick up what I want, leave. But I'm I'm still terrified of doing it. I get it. If it's during the day, I don't think anything of it. But the second I have to be in my car outside at night, instantly I'm like, maybe don't, maybe make sure your doors are locked. Oh, Yeah. Yeah, like, oh, I'm, it's a whole other thing that I switch into. And yeah, I've had my husband be like, I don't know what your thing is. And I'm like, it's because we've had two different experiences. A hundred percent. Our entire lives. Mm -hmm. I've explained that to so many male partners, so many, that I'm like, hey, have you ever been scared for your life just walking down the street at, at, at any point? And it's like, not really. I'm like, yeah. Well. From the time we are fucking born. Yeah. From the time we're born. And by the way, should fear for our lives. Should. Sure. We, oh, we're in sure. this genre. Like, absolutely. Be be aware. Be hypervigilant, yeah. ladies. I'm sorry. I hate that I have to say it. But, uh, but, but nothing wrong with all of us just trying to stay alive. Correct. Because that is the reality. That is the reality. Yeah. Not in our heads. Speaking of which. Nope. When you got to... Um, the suspect Clark, which is a wild story, mm. wild story. Um, but this idea that this fourth victim, this fourth boy, Walter, the mother, the, the, there's a child pretending to be Walter. Mother is saying, that's not my child. Police say, take him home, try it out. She comes yeah. back saying, this is not my child. And they send her to a psych ward. They believed a random child Male child off the street. Well, if he says that he's Walter, he must be. You must be crazy. That's the kind of shit that mm -hmm. makes my blood boil. Yep. And anxiety. Boop, 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 boop. Oh, it's so terrifying to me that you would rather believe a random ragamuffin who's rolled in off the street than a mother who's lost their child, whose child is missing. Get out. Get we're, out. We're not just going to walk right past Ragamuffin, are we? <laughs> <laughs> this line is hitting hard tonight, and I oh, don't I, know why, but listen. I love it. I Look, you're, you're absolutely right. No one's going to know a child better than their own parent. But to be like, it's uh, the kid says so, it's close enough, here you go. Get out. The Get second out. she goes, that's not my child. But also, he didn't say, no, it is your child. He went, try him anyway. Like, get out, sir. Like, that's oh, such I know garbage. 
Oh, it's just trash. believe women when they speak. And uh, if something happens to them, don't uh, blame women for it. Here's what I would like to say. Uh, Clifford Olson was the one with the money for his wife and child, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, again, infuriating. Here's what I'd like to say. To the mother of, of Walter, I'd like her to get a chunk of money. She was sent to a psych ward because she was told oh, that she was yeah. crazy because it, that's someone that I'd like money to go to. Oh, 100%. I would be more than happy for government money or whatever money. I'd be more than happy to give her a little bit of cash because guess what? That woman yeah. not only had to go to a psych ward for saying that this person, this child that was not her child was not her child, but she also, by the way, her child was murdered. 100%. It's it's awful. Can, can you imagine your child is murdered at the time is probably presumed missing. You're being told, well, this boy could be it. Give him a go. Well, I, yeah. I mean, that, like, that, that oh, woman I... is ruined for life. Like that just changes yes. your brain chemistry. Like then how do you trust? Like how do you, how do you function day to day? Give her half a million dollars. I chose a number at random. I love that. I mean, I, I love that. I was also like, yeah, what happened to her? I'm like, I don't know if I want to know. Oh, God. It's going it, to yeah. end up being so sad. And well, even if there's no record of it, I think it's safe to assume she went through a really rough time. Yeah. Her child she, was dead and she was oh. thrown in a psych ward because of it. My God. Well, here you go. Here's on the fly. Um, she continued to believe her son was still alive, um, despite there being a guilty plea um, by someone, uh, a judge, uh, you know. Um, she, let's see. Uh, the oh, please. Um, she continued to search for her son for the rest of her life. Uh, she attempted several times to collect money that was owed to her by the police captain. Um, from a 1941 case, so I think she sued him. Good. And they were like, "Yes, she should get money." Um, yes. She was supposed to get fifteen thousand, which was about like three hundred and twenty, three hundred and thirty now. Um. Never got it, and uh, she died in 1964 at the age Ugh. of 75. Also, in my quick research, not not that we're going to go back, but um, Colin Thatcher's first name was also Wilbert. Was also Wilbert. Yeah, they just both chose to go by their middle names. If you're a Wilbert or you've named a child a Wilbert, if you have a Wilbert in your life, let us know. We're Drop curious. us a line. Comment on our socials. I'm very curious. Um, listen, and my final thought on all of this is as you were taking us down this road, as you were, you know, going through all these different suspects and whatnot, I thought for sure this case was going to be solved. So the reveal that this is the oldest cold case in the area, the the, the idea that this still has not been solved is wild. And again, so sad this poor yeah. woman just, again, like, well, listen, and, and it, we say, I feel like we say that almost every week, but again, um, if if we learned anything from a case being solved 50 years later, which we started at the beginning, yeah. my hope is that over time um, there will be uh, an answer for this one too because I feel like I, I can't imagine what it would be like to be in the family of a, of a of some, having lost a, lo- a loved one in such a terrible, horrific way and not being able to have answers. Yeah. And I mean, her nieces say they have suspects. They aren't announcing them publicly because they're hoping that the police will do something about it. But I I I honestly hope they're the ones who solve it. So do I. I really do. So do do I. Because, listen, you know as well as I do, these things get bungled constantly in the system, yeah. and and I think it's wonderful that they've taken up the mantle, and yes, I, ho- I hope that as well. Um, Christy Oxborough, thank you so much for your work. Exceptional as always. 12 out of 10. We don't deserve you. Oh, it's an honor. And how fun to say Saskatchewan so many times. I loved it. I loved every second of it. And we thank you, dear listeners, for joining us on this wild ride. If you haven't already, give us a follow on the socials on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at True Crime and Cocktails on Twitter at Not Detectives. And if you'd like some more bonus content, go over to patreon.com slash True Crime and Cocktails to learn more about our subscription-based service over there. And as I said earlier, ho, ho, hold your pants. It's time for the new 2024 Christmas ornament. 
Head over to TrueCrewMerch.com, the only place for official True Crime and Cocktails merch on the net. Um, Christy, do you want to tell the people about next week's episode? On the next True Crime and Cocktails, love fraud. I could not be more excited about this. I am obsessed with this documentary. I hey. have written characters based on someone involved in this, and I just cannot wait to talk about it with you and all of our friends who are listening. Yeah. Um, do you want to, uh, Christy, do you want to say goodnight to the people? <laughs> Bringing it back. Good night, towel gal. <laughs> Good night, little spider men. <laughs>